Okay, so right to the city, I position it as a concept about people that live in a city. They want to increase or enhance the way they live, their conditions, their in general. Of course, it, it has specification, depends on which city you're talking about, or if there is any a city, in fact, or a human landscape could be different from a city. And that's divided between a city or an urban landscape in terms of right to the city. I think we can see that difference a lot in Lisbon and Greater Lisbon. Because we have a city which is polycentric, a lot concentric, everything goes around that, which is the city of Lisbon, which is a really powerful story and imaginarium. But the city of Lisbon only represents one fifth of the entire population that lives in the metropolitan area. So we have a right to the city formalized in Lisbon that attends issues more or less to do with public space, for example, and now because of housing, because the financialization of the city with this new term after the crisis enter Lisbon. So you have all the formal movements that apply themselves as right to the city movements you have in central Lisbon. But for me, what is questioning and interesting in, in, in Lisbon, but thinking Lisbon as a greater metropolitan area, is that you have a lot of movements which are not qualified as right to the city or not even qualified as a movement, but are daily basis practices of resistance and to search for a new common, a new way to do things. And that happens mostly in the periphery of Greater Lisbon on the five six of population live. But all these movements are really unknown and basically what is known is what's going on in the center of the city. For example, there's been, where we are now, there's been housing problems in this periphery since ever. But just now that's the uh, gentrification get in the center of the city and is a menace to the middle class. You see the housing thing and the housing movements being, you know, in the front pages, in the discussion, while in fact it's been an issue a long time ago in a major city. When I talk about the invisible city, in a way it seems like I'm promoting a city that doesn't exist. But the, the name sometimes depends on the context, because I was talking to people that didn't know nothing about this. But usually, of course, I don't think there's invisible, that city is really visible, at least for me. But it's so visible in a way, if you look for the right channels, you, if you compare to the mainstream city, which is really center in the space, which is Lisbon, in this case, in some cases, it's a city where a lot of things are going on and are much bigger than what's going on in the center. The problem is, and it has to do with history also, because the center of Lisbon exists for hundreds of years. So all the decision making in terms of cultural, institutional, academic, political, are done in the center of Lisbon, which is a historical city where a lot of imaginary is produced because of being a capital, former empire, etc. And the periphery, as I mentioned before, is much bigger than the city itself, only exists for 50 years with the size, and it was done mainly by immigrant move movements, and a lot of them also from Africa, from former colonies. So what I say is that as an example, I do it as an example, and I use music and culture as that example, to show people how our policies and our mainstream is detached from real life in a bigger city. And I use the example of music because if you are in this neighborhood, even in this neighborhood, you never find, or rarely you find official places where people can, for example, express the cult local culture. Mm -hmm. So you have to do it in apartments, you know, in home studios. And if you see the results of the production that came out of these home studios, they have more, because the city is connected uh, with wireless and with internet, etc. They have, for example, in YouTube, more views, their music, than the mainstream music that are more sell in, in record uh, shops. This was the example, so people can see and think, you have like music which is, for example, based in African rhythms or sometimes sang in Creole, which is not an official language here, but have more views than people that are, and, it's, and one like do it yourself, done that way, and it has more views than, for example, um, a well-known singer with all production, with agency, that sells their records everywhere. So I use this term of the music to show, oh, there's a huge city that people don't care about, don't know what's going on, in opposite to a center with the size, but the size with a little, bit, a little bit of autism, you know, not looking to the broader range. 
I will give you an example. Uh, in the cities that surround Lisbon, in the 90s, there was this huge rehouse program. It was, in fact, to take people out of the shanty towns. And that was a widely support of that. But then when you look, in fact, what happened, they were rehoused, not in the case of the city of Lisbon, but in the cities around, really far away from where they were. Because where they were, in the 90s, were already central places. So that was a process of gentrification. You, get, you take poor people from central areas, you put them in rehousing far away in, in rural areas that were really shipped the terrain. And those central places now are real estate and are uh, highways, you know. And nobody called that gentrification, and nobody worried about them. Or, because a lot of them were immigrants, they say, no, no, they had their housing now, what they are complaining, right? But now, since the middle class is fighting because of this new stage of financing the city, which is going to the center, and why? Because 80% of people in Portugal live in houses they own. So you could think, okay, so what's the problem with the tenant market? Because the central of the city is in fact where the, the rents and tenants are. People don't own the houses. So it's possible to, you know, do this new stage where you can invest in the center and people with liberalization of the contracts get out. And that's why it's so central the debate about housing right now in the center. But it will affect people in the periphery because now if there were some houses of, of public houses which were with cheap rents, okay, they still exist, but around there were small cities where the, the rent was cheap and immigrants and families could live there. Now the middle class of Lisbon are getting out of Lisbon and going to live in those places. So those places are, the rents are getting rising. So what is going in the center is affecting the second ring, the third ring of the city, because rents are rising again. So that people are still going more upwards to somewhere that doesn't exist yet. But Me and Vils, which is a street artist. We were engaging with a group of rappers from a neighborhood called Seis de Mayo, 6th of May. And we engaged with them like, they're doing the music with help with means of production, you know, uh, lending cameras, uh, helping putting them on festivals, because of what I said before, you know, that they really have public, so let's qualify the place where they are going to sing. So we started this relation. But the neighborhood where they live is being destroyed. And a lot of people are without housing access to housing because they are, the neighborhood is being destroyed right now but the census that says who is going to apply for a house or not was done in 93 so a lot of people doesn't exist no more a lot of people new people live there they don't have the rights so in the first phase we thought about taking photos of local people special singers from traditional music for Cape Verde but also rappers and we represent them on the houses it was the first stage then there was invitation to do something in the National Museum of Ancient Art about the story of the Portuguese portraits. And they invite us and we immediately ask people of 6th of Mayo, the youngsters, if we want to do something together. Because we were thinking, okay, they're going to do this uh, exhibit about portrait in Portugal and these narratives need to be there because there's, there's are also narratives of Portugal, people that emigrated, that self-built their houses. Some of them don't have the right to housing, so we thought of that about also a Portuguese narrative. So we talked to them and we settled to a plan which was to steal a, a wall from the neighborhood. So they were destroying the neighborhood. So we thought about, okay, let's steal a wall because they are going to destroy the wall. So we steal the wall and put it in the museum without telling the museum that we are going to do that. And then we, with the local musicians, we choose three people from different generations from the neighborhood like an old lady that was the first ones to arrive and to build the houses, a younger kid that was already born there, and a new generation, a recent generation of immigration. So Vils portrayed the three characters on that wall, and we did a short documentary about these three uh, different people to show the different levels of, uh, of stories of Lisbon. So that was the idea. And, and uh, also because we usually are always in self-production things. So we are in neighbors that people have self-products and then I have the habit of doing do it yourself things also. But in that case, the idea was to enhance their narrative. So that's why Vils, which is a very known artist, we use the National Museum in order to enhance the narrative. So people know that are people, for example, living in conditions, people that, in the case of Carlotta, which is one of the women we interview, that has been a slave before, so she talks about their past of slavery in San Tomé, so people will know that there are people here now that pass through this experience.
It's really difficult to do that. Of course, we read each other, we communicate between each other, between cities. And the major problem is the same, which is we have a neoliberalism that products space and produce space in a way to exclude. So, of course, it's good for us to, to be in contact with each other. But as you mentioned in your question, a lot of those cities are already peripheral. So if we talk about Lisbon, about Athens, about Madrid, Rome maybe, they're not in the center of Europe and they are usually cities where people don't have too much resources and they are far away from each other. So imagine if I want to contact with Athens. We are both peripheral. We don't have money to travel, even middle class, for example. So it means it's really difficult for us to, to settle a network. Of course, that exists. There have been a lot of encounters between us but it's rare and it's really difficult to be in contact because the precarious conditions produce a precarious network also, so it's difficult. And then other problem is the cities are badly connected sometimes between each other itself. So for example, if Lisbon is badly connected between each other in regarding the problems, it's really difficult to have too much people to do that job. For example, when I go to those connections abroad, uh, I go a lot of times, for example, me, myself. And I met people from Lisbon that I don't even see in Lisbon, but we met, it's, it's strange, okay? So first, I think the first job for <clears throat> now is to, to find a good mass inside, to go around these obstacles, which are the segregation that split us a lot, the, the materialization of the problems that also splits a, a lot because it's different for a middle class student which is not finding a room that he can pay from a, a guy that lives here with these different problems. And his, things are materialized in a way that spares us apart while well, the problem in general is the same. So now I'm betting more in, in finding ways to connect people here. And of course, network is important, but it's really, we not, cannot stick to it just okay because i know people that for example are always traveling around europe but then they're not they forgot the grassroots because it's appealing to be around europe talking with people about problems that you know but then you you lose your contacts to know what is going on and to be updated you know so it's, there's a challenge there yeah and also there are some commodification about bigger european projects which are commodificating people that came from this uh, social movements and they, they simply pass to a level where they are just in European Union doing things but never on the grassroots so it's tricky it's supposed to be good and we have to do it but it's difficult to manage all this well there's a lot of uh, layers to deal with the subject one of them is to know if in these connections we're doing international, if people are representing themselves or are acting in behalf of something, and that's important, for example, I can, I can go to a meeting in Athens and talk about the housing problems in the periphery of Lisbon, but if really I'm not there every day, if I don't squat every day, if I don't nothing, I'm just there on behalf, it will be difficult for me to come here and translate what I learned into a practice. Okay, so that's one of the problems, which is people that have access to that networks, a lot of times are not the people that really are there. So that's one of the points and goes from the basis of the, of the scale. Then I think it lacks a lot solidarity between people. For example, how can I, we were talking about 6th of May, how can I can provide that someone of 6th of May know about a network that's going to happen in Rome, for example. How I can provide them, which is already precarious, to go to that meeting, you know, the, who take care of the kids, who, who go, for example, how you miss it one day of job, you know. And then what happens is that everyone that are representing those networks, people that can do it, can afford it in a way or not, because the university pays, because I know how to get funding, you know. So one of my first concerns and the first layer is exactly the who is in those meetings and why. Then, of course, it can help, but I'm going to give you an example that puts me a little bit old, but could be interesting. Like before 2001, before the 9-11, it was the first time, I think, 
the general demonstrations were interconnected globally. It was brutal. For example, we had a demonstration here. A lot of people came from Greece, from Spain, etc. I had a demonstration in um, in Prague or in Geneva, and we all get there, and you had thousands and thousands of people from everywhere. So I think when people, when people were discussing globalization, globalization not in an economic term, but in terms of, of mobilization of people, was a little bit success. People were, but then you had Geneva. There was a lot of um, repression on people. One guy died, right? There was a lot of repression. Then you had the 9-11. They changed a lot the laws about terrorism and the, the way you can lock up people just for suspicion. And I think there was a, a construction of a kind of an enemy between repression and also the way people think that stopped people from going elsewhere. I know when I, maybe I was younger, but at the time, before 9-11, it was normal for me to have spent a lot of time, months in Athens or in Spain, because there was a, a solidarity network that can receive me and can be there fighting for something that I also fight here. And I was learning there, you know. And I think that's because of the borders, even if they are open, they really control, you know, for example, in terms of what you do, vigilant, you know. And I think that is quitting people for doing things. They need to cut that also.